2 Timothy again. Uh, we spent the last couple of weeks uh, in 2 Timothy, and I'm finally getting to the verse that brought me to 2 Timothy in the first place. Uh, I, this was the one I really wanted to concentrate on, but I found those others. The book of 2 Timothy is the very last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote before he was uh, executed. And so, and he knew that he was fixing to be, or about to be executed, fixing to be is a West Texas terminology. Um, but uh, uh, he was about to be executed. He was aware of that situation. And he put everything that was of utmost importance to him in, into this uh, book. And the, the verses that we're going to look at today are the verse is uh, basically is his statement of faith, and it's extremely important. Uh, and, and, and it's something I hope and pray that each one of us uh, can, can have and understand and feel, but I want us, we're going to look at it a little stronger. But before we do, uh, let's talk about Fort Knox for a moment. Everybody knows what Fort Knox is, right? Uh, that is a, an extremely unique and interesting place, isn't it? It contains over 143 million ounces of gold primarily in 27 pound gold bars, but there are some gold coins and some other things and at various and sundry times throughout its, its uh, brief history, it was built back in the 1930s. Uh, it has contained some of our, the world's most precious original documents that we have. It contained it for a while, the original Magna Carta that was written back in the, I don't remember the thousands or 1100s or somewhere back in there. It contained for a while the original Declaration of Independence that was uh, uh, our nation founded back in 1776. And, and so it's, it's had a lot of, of really uh, unique things in it. And, and it, it contains all of this gold that our government owns and uh, it's, it's just a real interesting, a real interesting place. It's probably, quite possibly, the most secure place in the world. It is 42 acres, and it contains the most high-tech security devices that we can come up with today. They, they are constantly updating and upgrading since the very beginning. Uh, it's made out of 4,200 tons of concrete, not counting the steel doors, the vault doors, has all of the high-tech uh, locking systems, it has video surveillance, it has motion surveillance, it has uh, movements, uh, sensors for like if somebody's trying to tunnel in underneath it, uh, it has pill boxes, it has a machine gun nest, it has its own personal security detail that, that guards it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, I mean, it, it is a secure place. And not only is it a fairly small building, not really much larger than our church, maybe a little taller, but not much, much larger than this, sitting on 42 acres, but that 42 acres is centered right in the heart of 109,000 acres of a U.S. Army military base where they uh, train tank drivers. So there are hundreds of tanks. There are thousands of armed soldiers. It, it's be pre pretty tough to try to break into, wouldn't it? Plus, it has air surveillance. If somebody was to try to, you know, bring in an airplane to, you know, to try to bomb it or whatever. I mean, it is. It's secure because it contains such a priceless and precious treasure, doesn't it? How many of you would take the, if you had 143 million ounces of gold, you'd, you'd come up with a pretty secure place to try to keep that, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd, I don't think you'd keep it in a coffee can in the backyard, would you? <laughs> and you know that's the other thing about Fort Knox is 
the entrance is so extremely limited other than the security detail. One president, uh, FDR, back in the early 40s, went through it once it had been completed. He, he's the only president that has ever been inside the building at Fort Knox. In 1974, for about four hours, it was opened up to a very select group of people to prove that the gold was still there. And in 1993, it was opened briefly for just a, a couple of hours to, to allow outsiders. But other than that, nobody gets in and out of Fort Knox. And so that, that adds to the security of it. And so it's, we, we have a confidence that that what is kept in there is safe and secure because we know the might and the power of the U.S. government and the U.S. military. I, can you imagine trying to enter into a U.S. military base with thousands of armed soldiers and tanks and, you know, all of their artillery guns and their mortars and, you know, all of those different things. Can you imagine trying to sneak in there and, and try to steal a little bit of that? I can't imagine trying to carry a 27 pound block of gold and, you know, in one arm, much less all of it that it contains. So, but it is, it is kept safe because we respect the power and the might of our government and our military. But see, we as Christians, we have a treasure far, far greater Amen. that is kept by someone far, far stronger. And we know that he will keep it safe. Let's look at our scripture this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 it says, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Let us pray. Our most gracious God in heaven, Father, we thank you today that you are watching over us, that you are caring for us. We thank you that you are God and you alone are God. We thank you today, God, that you are guarding and protecting what we have entrusted to you. And Father, just help us to show others how they too can come to you and put their faith and their trust in you. Lord, I pray today that you will give me the words, give me the imagery to, to show today what a truly wonderful, loving, and awesome God you are. Help me to present this message today in the way you desire it to be presented and not in the way I desire it. We love you today. We praise you for who you are and for all that you do. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. So let's look briefly at this verse. I want to kind of break it down into, into segments. And first it says, I know whom I have believed. We know where we have placed our faith. Just as we have placed our faith in the U.S. military to protect Fort Knox and all of the technologies that we have to protect Fort Knox, we also can place our faith in God through Jesus Christ, can't we? And he is going to safeguard our treasures for us. See, everybody believes in something. We believe in Jesus Christ, or we need to believe in Jesus Christ. But not everybody believes in God, do they? Not everybody has faith in Christ. And I, I found three different, as I meditated <clears throat> pondered upon this, I found three kind of distinct groups. 
And the first one is the atheist. And they claim that there is no God, but they're really kind of kidding themselves because what they're mm -hmm. essentially saying is they are gods because they believe in themselves and they trust only in themselves and they trust in their science. And too many of our atheists, or so many of our atheists today are some of the most highly educated, intelligent individuals that we have, uh, that are on the face of the earth. And they've learned and they've worked and they've studied and, and they think that they have all of the answers or that they can acquire all of the answers from studying their science and through hypotheses and formulas and all of these different things. But Psalms 14 and 1 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So see, they're fools and they're just fooling themselves if they think that they can define God by a mathematical equation. Because God is so much bigger. You know, Albert Einstein spent 14 years trying to come up with the theory of relativity. He spent 30-something years and was very unsuccessful trying to come up with the, he called it the theory of everything. And he was unsuccessful at that. But see, there's science that they're so dependent upon, that they're so reliant upon. Their science is really merely a study of who God is, isn't it? And what God has already done and what God has already figured out. And they're fooling themselves. And they're really just a fool because they say there is no God, but they're really making God themselves into a God. The second group of folks that I've kind of noticed are the ones that I like to call the driftwood. And I thought Robbie's, and we didn't coordinate this this morning, her, her children's sermon this morning kind of fit this group of folks. And unfortunately, this is one of the largest groups that we, that we have around. They have a concept that there's some ubiquitous unseen force in nature that's kind of controlling things, but they don't really understand and know that there's a God. They may or may not call it a God or God's plural, but their faith is placed in, they call it in karma or in fate or in chance or in luck. But see, they just drift around following the newest, coolest belief that is out there, don't they? They go from here to there. They are described for us in Ephesians chapter 4 and 14. It says, as a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. The kind of see the imagery of a driftwood there? It's just bouncing out in the ocean and, and everything is just carrying them around and it's just fate that brings them here and it's karma that takes them over there and it's luck that brought them to this point. And see, they, they following all of the coolest, latest trends, hoping they'll find the right one. And you know, this week they're into Scientology. Next week they may be into Buddhism and the week after that they may be into a transcendental meditation or Zen or whatever is cool and whatever is politically correct and whatever is trending on social media. They're going to follow those things and try to find it. Uh, they don't know what they believe. And they're constantly following the tides and the winds of acceptance and political correctness. But then there are the believers, the believers in the Lord God Almighty. These are the true believers. They've seen the power of God. They have felt the love of God in their life. They put their faith and their trust in him. And it says that we can know him. Not just know about him, but we can know him. We can have this personal, intimate relationship with him, much like 
in a marriage situation like two spouses know one another. I know things about Robbie that no one else in here knows. I know where her moles are. I know where her scars are. I know what the scars are from. I know how she thinks about things. I know how she's going to react in certain situations. And she knows the same thing about me. A lot of times I can finish her sentences for her. Usually I don't get to make many sentences because she talks all the time. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. She knows me and I don't, in that close, intimate, personal way. We can have that same close, intimate, personal relationship with God. We can know all that we can know about God. We can read his word. We can converse with him. We can see him at work in the world around us. And we can draw close and be very intimate with him. We can know. We can know whom we have believed. Amen. Not just know about him, but we can know him. In Matthew 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That is knowing, that is knowing who you believe in. We can know whom we have believed in, who we have placed our faith in, who we have placed our trust in. The second thing is, I am convinced that he is able. I am convinced. Because we know God, we can be convinced that he is able, not hope that he is able. We don't, we don't have to wonder. We don't have to... to uh, guess about it. We have witnessed his power. We have seen his hand at work in our lives. Amen. We know he's always kept every promise that he's ever made. Amen. And that he has fulfilled those promises exceedingly abundantly. Amen. We don't have to worry. And we don't have to fear. We have no doubts. Our God is able. But what about the atheist? He believes in himself and the power of knowledge. Well, I'm not real sure about you, but I know me and I know my failings and I know my shortcomings <laughs> and I know my lack of intelligence in many, many, many situations. I know more about what I don't know than what I do know. I know how frail my body has become. I know how frail my desires have become. You know, I... It's hard to get me out of my chair once I get propped up, my feet raised up, and the blanket pulled over. It's just real difficult to get up and go do anything. So why would I have faith and confidence in myself when I know how weak I truly am? And what about the driftwood? The driftwood folks are even worse off because they don't can't decide what they, which way to go, what they're going to do to keep themselves safe. What if, what if they were in the right place last week and this week they die because they done changed places? What? They, they don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. They don't know which way they're supposed to be. And, and so they're just hoping and it leads to a life of fear and anxiety, doesn't it? Because they never know for sure. Am I here now? And you know, what, what if, like I said, what if I was in the right place last week, but it's next week that he calls me home and I'm not in the right place next week. I was there last week, but God, can you look at that? No. And so they, they struggle and they wonder about hoping against hope to be in the right place at the right time, but scared to death that they won't. See, faith, luck, chance, those are pretty fickle gods, aren't they? Just ask anybody at a poker table. Those are very fickle gods. But see, our God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen. So we are convinced that he is able. 
if he is able to guard what we have committed to him. What have we committed? What exactly do we commit to God? Well, the right answer, what I hope thought is going through your head is everything. Of course, we, when we accept him as Lord and Savior, we, we, we entrust to him our eternal salvation, our eternal life, eternity to him, doesn't it? But it should also include our life here on earth. It should include our families, our jobs, our financial resources, our marriages, everything about our life, our jobs, our purpose in life. We need to entrust to God, and that is such a most precious treasure because God is the one who has given us life. He gave this life to us so we can entrust it to him. And he is able to guard whatever most precious thing, this precious little baby right here, we've entrusted that to God. And he can hold it tighter than Fort Knox ever could. Amen. There's still a chance somebody can figure out a way to break into Fort Knox. Because there are rumors and conspiracies running rampant that the gold is not really in Fort Knox, that it's all been taken out and the government spent it all and they just took some blocks and painted them gold and put back in there. Yeah, I, okay? See, our lives are secure with God. We, we don't have to worry. We don't have to doubt. We don't have to fear because he is in control. He is in charge and he has promised to hold us in the palm of his hand. Mm -hmm. See, the atheist has committed all of those same things to his own physical and mental capabilities. That's a little bit like <clears throat> trying to carry this large duffel bag full of $100 bills down a dark street <laughs> in Chicago with a BB gun for protection. I don't think it's going to go very far. Because it's too frail. We're too weak in and of ourselves. Our minds are too finite to comprehend the vastness of it all. But God can understand it all. And the driftwood just doesn't know for sure. So he just commits a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit over here and this part down there. And he don't know what. So he just kind of tries to spread all his, his investments around in various and sundry places, hoping that, hoping Without, beyond hope that, that at that time, when that time comes, that something will be in the right place. And that maybe at least his life will be good or his marriage will be good or his job will be good or heaven forbid that his eternal life will be in the right place. But he don't know for sure. And he's scared to death. See, we can confidently entrust every aspect of our life to God, he is able to guard them, to protect them, to keep them safe. He created us and gave us life. He gives us our purpose. See, if he's powerful enough to speak light into existence, to speak the universe into existence, He's powerful enough to guard what I've got. Amen. If he loves us enough to send his own son to die on the cross for me, I know he loves me enough to care for me. If he is powerful enough to set the stars and the planets in their place, put them into motion, I know he is powerful enough to guard what I have entrusted to him. Mm -hmm. See, your life is a great treasure, isn't it? Do you know who you have believed today? Do you know him? How well do you know him? How closely do you know him? How intimate have you become with him? Have you committed Everything in your life to him, or are you trying to hold a little bit back for yourself? Maybe hold a little bit back to put into something else. Or have you committed everything that is about your being 
to him. You depending on yourself or on your knowledge and your strength, good luck to you. Or are you just kind of drifting along, hoping beyond hope, afraid that chance and luck are going to be against you, <clears throat> anxious to be in the right place at the right time, but not able to? Come, know him today. It's a perfect opportunity to today to begin that relationship with him, to know whom you have believed and to commit unto him everything in your life so that he can guard it and protect it. Far, far better than any other option that's available to us. Would you stand with me please today? Our most gracious Father in heaven, Lord God, I thank you today for all that you do. I thank you that you love us, that you care for us, that you protect us, and that we can trust ourselves to you. Just as Brother Paul, at the very end of his life, knew that he had committed everything to you and that he was trusting you to take care of him and to provide for him. We too can know you and trust you and believe in you and commit ourselves to you and that you'll be faithful to guard us, to watch over us, to love us and to care for us until that day we meet you face to face. Father, if there's anyone here this morning that has not come to know you, that does not believe in you, has not committed it to you, Father, take, let them take advantage of this opportunity to come and begin their life with you today. I ask all this in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to stand. We're going to sing. JL's going to lead us. If God is speaking to your heart this morning, would you come, please, as we uh, sing our hymn of invitation?